Hello again. In this video I want to introduce the concept of a bubble sort. So bubble sort is in some ways the hello world of sorts. It's not necessarily an ideally efficient sort, but we like to use it in many ways to start off things because it is so very easy to write the, the code for. So to describe what a bubble sort is, remember we're doing this in an array. We have an immutable array and I would like to get all of these values into the right order. Okay, so I want to sort them from least to greatest. And the way that we're going to do this with bubble sort is we're going to run through the array and each time through we're going to compare adjacent elements and swap them if they're out of order. And then we'll start back at the beginning and we'll do it again and we'll do it again and we'll do it again until we have the array in proper order. Okay. So if, we, if I actually run through this uh, type of behavior, what we're going to do is we're going to start off with, I'm going to take and make a copy of this array so I can save it for later, uh, start off with the looking at the 5 and the 8. Well, 5 should come before 8, so that's fine. However, our next step, we compare the 8 and the 3. 8 should not come before 3, so we need to swap these. And this is where our temporary comes into play, is that I'm going to take the 8 and I'm going to move it down into a temporary. Now in reality, in the memory of the computer, there's still an 8 here. I don't actually move it, I copy it. And so I wind up with two 8s for a little while, but it's a lot easier in this graphical representation for me to simply click and drag things around. Then I move the 3 over, and then I move the 8 back up. In fact, this is exactly that what I just did. This is a swap of these two memory values. You can think of this as, going back to the car analogy, if I were moving, if I had two cars, they were in two different parking spaces, and I wanted to swap them, switch one to the, to the parking space of the other and vice versa, this is exactly what I'd do. It. I'd, what I'd do, I'd take one of these cars, I'd pull it into the temporary spot, then I would take the other car, move it over, and then I would take the one from the temporary spot and move it in. And that's exactly what we just did. So now the 8 is here, and I compare the 8 and the 2. Well, the 8 should come after the 2, so the 8 moves down to the temporary again. The 2 moves over, and then our 8 moves up into there. The 8 is actually supposed to go before the 9, so it stays there. And then we check, and the 9 is not supposed to go before the 6, so the 9 moves down into the temporary, the 6 moves over, and then the 9 moves up. 9 should not go before the 4, so the 9 jumps back down to the temporary. Now you might wonder, why didn't I just leave the 9 there and keep moving stuff down? Well, because when we write this inside of the computer, we're going to make sure that every step, we're going to basically have a swap in there, and it's going to be a full swap. Here again, the 9 comes after the 7, so the 9 moves down, the 7 moves over, and the 9 moves back up. Doesn't stay there long though because then we have the 9 coming after the 1, so the 9 moves down, the 1 moves over, and the 9 moves back up. And we've now finished our first pass through the array. And something to notice about this, when we are done, we are absolutely guaranteed that the largest element is here at the end. So in a way, our array, this part is now sorted. Okay. So the next time I go through, I don't need to consider the 9. I know it's in the right place. So if we do one more pass here, the 5 and the 3, 5 should come after the 3. So the 5 will move down, the 3 will move over, and the 5 will move up. The 5 should also come after the 2. So the 5 goes down, the 2 moves over, and the 5 moves back, the 5 moves up. The 5 actually goes before the 8, so it stays there. The 8 does not go before the 6, so 8 moves down, 6 moves over, 8 moves up. 8 should come after the 4. Now I'm going to, because I'm doing this on, on the screen, I'm going to be a little bit lazy here and say, okay, the eight, the, the 4 moves over, the 8 would move up, but then it would compare to the 7 and so it would move back down, 
and the 7 would slide over, and then the 8 would come back up. But the 8 comes after the 1, so the 8 would come back down, the 1 moves over, and then the 8 moves up. We've now completed two passes through the array, and this is what the array looks like at the end of the second pass. The two largest elements are at the end, and now when we do the next pass through, I don't have to consider them, so I'm basically going to stop looking at that point. Three and two, they are in the wrong order. So the three comes down, the two moves over, and the three moves up. Three does come before five, five does come before six, six does not come before four. So the six moves down, the four moves over, and the six moves up. Six does come before seven, but seven does not come before one. So the seven moves down, the one moves over, and the seven moves up. I have now completed my third pass. You notice this is getting faster every time because the as I get more things sorted in here, I have fewer things that I have to work with. So I start back at the beginning. Two and three, correct order. Three and five, correct order. Five and four, wrong order. So I move the five down, the five moves the four moves over, I move the five back up. Five and six, correct order. Six and one, wrong order. So the six moves down, the one moves over, and the six moves up. I am now done with my fourth pass, and the four largest elements are here, so this is all I have left. So to start the fifth pass, the two is in the right place relative to the three, the three is in the right place relative to the four, the four is in the right place relative to the five, but the five should go after the one. So the five moves down, the one moves over, and then the five moves up. And we could continue this process, and hopefully you see that, so that now completes my fifth pass. The next pass, the, the four will move down, the next pass, the three will move down, the next pass, the two will move down, and at that point, we are done, because the one is in the correct location. So that kind of walks you through the process of doing the bubble sort. Now, we want to actually code the bubble sort. What type of code would be used to, to write this? So I'm going to write a single file. I'm going to call it sorts.scala. And we're going to define a bubble sort. Uh, what type should we sort in our bubble sort? Um, I'm going to pass in an array. And I'm going to make this an array of doubles. Uh, this function doesn't return anything to us. It simply changes the order of things in the array. This array is mutable, so this function is going to mutate it as opposed to giving us back uh, some different result. Inside of here, I need to have two loops. So there's the one loop. I have one loop that's basically what happens when this runs down and it checks every pair. Check that to check, that to that, that to that, that to that, 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 boom, boom, boom. That's the inner loop. Okay. There's also an outer loop to make sure that the inner loop happens multiple times. Now there are two forms of a bubble sort. One is a flagged bubble sort where that outer loop will stop if nothing gets moved. The other sort, and the one that I'm going to write, is a non-flagged bubble sort where we're just going to say, look, this is going to happen n minus one times. Okay? Uh, because if you go through the process of, of running through the array n minus one times, you're guaranteed that you have a sorted array. So I'm going to have a variable i, and I'm going to write a for loop. And i is going to go from zero until arr.length minus one. Why minus one? Well, because it turns out that I, as I said, I want to do this n minus one times. Um, if we go back and we look at this, when I'm done, at the point where I, my last switch, I swap the two and the one, 
I don't need to go through it again because they're the one move to the only place that was left, it has to be the right place. So I can stop one shy of going through this n times. Now what happens in these n minus one times? Well, this is I run through the array. So I'm gonna put another loop in here. Uh, and this loop is going to go from zero until arr.length minus one and minus i. We should talk about that for a second. Why minus one minus i? Well, the minus one is because even the first time I went through this, my j would start here and then it goes here and here and boom, 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 boom. Notice that j shouldn't go here because every time I'm comparing the jth element to the j plus one element. Well, I don't wanna to go to this last element because then I'd be trying to compare to here, I'd go out of the bounds of the index and our program would crash. So I have to stop one shy of that. Plus, as we saw, after the first pass through, the biggest element is here. So the next time, instead of stopping here, I'm gonna stop here. And the time after that, I'm gonna stop here. And the time after that, I'm gonna stop here. So that's why I subtract off i as well. And what happens inside of this inner for loop? I have to admit, I'm writing this as two separate for loops, though maybe I'll condense it in just a second because Scala allows us to put two of these generators in a single for loop. I do a check and I say if ARR sub i, sorry, sub j is greater than ARR sub j plus one. So j is our, is our inner loop, it's running through the array and I wanna check is a given element larger than the one after it. Well, if that's the case, I need to swap them. And this is where we had that temporary space. And in fact, I'm going to create a variable called temp. You might notice that my variable names ARR and temp match what I put into the diagram. Here's ARR for our array and temp for our little extra single value in memory. So I'm gonna set this equal to ARR sub J that is the pull the one value out and stick it down into temp. And then I need to move the element from ARR sub J plus one into ARR sub J. So that's my second move there, I do that assignment. And then the last thing I have to do is set the value at J plus one to what we had stored in the temp up here at the beginning, okay? Um, as I mentioned earlier, if I wanted to, I could shorten this a little bit because Scala allows us to put two generators inside of a single for loop. This is a style issue. You can feel free to do this whether, you know, either with uh, two nested for loops or with the double generator. And then to test to make sure that this works, Let's make an array. Uh, let's make an array that has 20 doubles in it. And they will be random numbers between zero and one. And to make sure that, you know, to start off with, they are not sorted. Uh, let's print them out in a comma separated uh, fashion. I'm gonna copy that line because I'm gonna print them again, but in between the two, I'm gonna call bubble sort on that array. So if we run that, see if we have any errors. Uh, oh, I didn't call this ARR here. It's called nums there. Okay, so the first one, we have a 0 0.1, a 0 0.5, a 0 0.7, a 0 0.3, a 0 0.9, a 0 0.9, a 0 0.9, a 0 0.5, a 0 0.8, 0 0.8, 0 0.9, okay. They're not in sorted order. For the second time that we print it, 0 0.08, 0 0.1, 0 0.11, 0 0.14, 0 0.36, all look sorted even down to the end where it's 0 0.95, 0 0.96, 0 0.97. Okay. So there we go. We have a working bubble sort. You've seen how it actually works when you view it and conceptualize it. And you've also seen what it looks like at code. How much work does this sort do? Well, this outer loop happens 
order n times. So if our, if our array has n elements in it, technically this is n minus one times. And the inner loop happens, well, the first time it happens n minus one times, and then it happens n minus two, and n minus three, and n minus four. So on average, it happens n over two times. This whole thing, everything that's in the middle here, winds up happening on what we refer to as order n squared times. And basically when we say that, we're throwing away all the constants. It, maybe it's an, it's an n squared over two. There's, there's actually a, a minus n in there as well. We don't care about those things. What really matters is that the amount of, the number of times this has to do a comparison always changes as, the, always goes as the number of elements squared. Okay. So if I have twice as many elements, I'm gonna have to do this comparison four times as many times. And if I have 10 times as many elements, I'm gonna to have to do this 100 times as much, okay? And that's, that's one of the characteristics of, of the bubble sort. In fact, all the sorts we're gonna work on right now are these order n squared sorts. And the downside of that is you cannot use these to sort really big arrays. Because computers are fast, they're fine with 100 elements. They're even fine with 1,000 elements. They'll even be fine with 10,000 elements. But if you get up to a million elements or 10 million elements, well, a million is 10 to the 6, so when you square it, you have to do 10 to the 12 comparisons. And that's enough that even on a modern fast computer, you're going to see it slow down a little bit. It's, it's going to take a little while. Um, and if you go up to 10 million or something like that, you will definitely start to see uh, a delay. And in fact, it might get bad enough that you're not willing to wait for it. What about in here? How many times do I have to drag things around? Well, it turns out the answer for this is you don't know. Okay? You don't know in general because it depends upon the, the, the thing, on the values that are in the array. If the array is already sorted, it turns out this will never happen and you'll never move any memory around. You'll just do your order n squared comparisons and never move a single thing. Um, however, if the values are randomly distributed, it turns out that you do this about half the time and so you wind up doing order n squared memory moves as well. Okay, so so this, this algorithm happens to be order n squared for both the number of comparisons that it does and the number of, of memory moves that it does. Uh, and so, so that is the way the bubble sort works. Um, it's not necessarily efficient and it's also one sort, <clears throat> what I was doing here Humans would never, ever, ever do this, okay? If, if I gave you a bunch, whether it was folders or cars in a parking lot or whatever, you would not do to your, to the, uh, the set of values that you had to sort, you would not do exactly what this algorithm uh, does. The advantage of this algorithm is, this is really simple. Uh, this is actually a very hard thing to mess up. When I write this and I compile it and I run it, I feel very confident it's going to work the only thing I could have possibly, that I've, when I've, I've done this multiple times, you know, for students, the only thing I ever seem to mess up in class is that. Uh, if I accidentally turn this around and do a less than, it's also possible to, to forget a minus one someplace and do something uh, like that. But for the most part, the bubble sort is really easy to write. It's just not all that efficient. Um, and, and that's fine as long as you're always sorting small things. It becomes a bit problematic if you sort some, some large things.